Hello, this is Albert van Dijk, and um, in this little video I want to talk about model data fusion. So what is model data fusion? Well, basically, model data fusion implies that if, you've got a, if you have a model of the real world, uh, you think you more or less know how uh, the real world behaves, uh, and uh, but then you've also got actual data, actual observations of the world, and you're going to try and bring those two uh, together in, in some useful way. So uh, in this diagram here, uh, I've sort of listed some of the strengths and weaknesses of different data types and of models and data. So we, we could potentially we could just try and predict the world using only a model and using no data. Um, the, the benefit of, of biophysical models is they're predictive, so we can predict the future. Uh, we've built, we've conceptualized them ourselves so we can interpret uh, what they do. And again, if we can give them full and continuous coverage. You can, they can predict anything under any circumstance. Because, the, of course, the problem is with the models that if we uh, apply them that way without any constraining data, they'll be completely unhindered by reality. And probably much like these spherical cows, uh, but in unuseful ways. They won't tell us what we need to know about reality. So to uh, uh, address that, we can use observations. Of course, typically we can use on-ground observations, for instance, uh, in this case, hydrological modeling, we can use uh, stream flow measurements, we can uh, uh, measure water levels, um, and uh, indeed, uh, we can do that at quite a few lo locations, that what you, that's what you see here, there's colored dots, um, but they're still going to be relatively sparse, there's a lot of areas where we don't have these measurements, uh, and time zone we don't have these measurements, and also they don't tell us anything about the future, we still need our biophysical models to do that. Of course, satellite observations don't tell us about the future either, but they've got the benefit uh, of having full and frequent coverage. So we can fill the gaps, if you like, we can interpolate, if you like, between the um, uh, observations at, at, at the Earth's surface. And, um, uh, and deal that way, we can also deal with the weaknesses of satellite data, which is often using it, uh, looking at electromagnetic uh, properties, which is often not exactly what we want to know. Uh, and again, they're not predictive. We still need our models to do that. But by combining these three approaches, uh, we can hopefully uh, reduce each of these individual weaknesses. And that's what we mean by model data fusion. So how can we do model data fusion? And what, what way or what ways can we do that? Well, here's a bit of, a, 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 I suppose, a, a, a six sort of possible stages uh, of, uh, of uh, model data fusion. So, of six possible uses, you could say. So, uh, um, you could start with uh, using observation to actually develop your mental model. Uh, and that's what we're going to have a look at first. So, uh, we may need to develop our predictive equations of how the world works. So, for instance, um, you know, I might have some sort of mental model of, uh, of a river reach and say, well, uh, my mental model says I've got stream flow observations at the uh, upper end and stream flow observations at the lower end. There's some sort of irrigation area there. I don't know how big it is. Uh, and then probably some of it makes its way to wetlands and makes its way back to the river. Uh, but don't really know exactly how the system works. Well, that's where we can use satellite observation. So we can, for instance, use uh, these flow paths from the uh, digital elevation model that tells us exactly where the water may or may not go. Uh, and we can use um, uh, open water as observed by motors or microwave over water mapping. And we can see, well, this is the progression of a flood. So we can see the flood goes here. Uh, sometimes goes there, but it doesn't go there, and so forth. So we can develop a mental model of this floodplain. We can use land cover classification to tell us where irrigation areas are and also where they are not. Uh, and we can uh, sort of combine these data with uh, uh, estimates of evapotranspiration using temperature, for instance, or using other ways of estimating uh, uh, evapotranspiration, so water used by crops, to tell us which of these irrigation areas were actually irrigated at the time. Uh, at which time, and, and again, we can refine our mental model of this uh, of this floodplain of this river reach. So, a model formulation uh, as inputs, if you like, satellite observations can be already be tremendously uh, valuable like that. Uh, if I actually want, it, I've got my mental model, but I actually need I want to run it. I want to do some calculations on it, and so I can still use those very similar remote sensing data, if you like, to configure my model to give it inputs like, uh, again, like maybe uh, hectares of irrigated area or some such. Um, another example of inputs is where we can um, use a rainfall, for instance, as measured by satellites to, to complement our, uh, our on-ground network of gauges. So what you see here, the blue dots are individual rain gauges, but as you can see, there are large areas where we don't have any rain gauges, and that's where um, satellite rainfall measurements are really valuable. 
that they tell us something that we don't know already, which is, you know, what was the rain in these, in these outlying areas. Uh, and this map here is uh, just an uh, illustration that shows you in white those areas where satellite rainfall uh, adds information to the gauges. And so in black, conversely, those areas, the gauges are a network that's dense enough to, to sort of um, make satellite rainfall less useful. But as you can see, a large area of, this, of our country, uh, we can make really good use of satellite observations. Another example of uh, better input data into a model is we can use a DEM. As you see here, this is the, uh, the uh, Australian uh, uh, geofabric, as it's called, outlining catchments and, and, uh, and uh, creek lines and rivers and so forth. Uh, and we can use those to, um, to uh, inform our, our catchment modeling. And you might say um, that's not satellite data. Well, actually, it is because the large part it is derived from the shuttle radar topography mission. So, again, indirectly, but satellite data are really helping us there. The first step where you can use satellite data is actually calibrating your model. So if, if you can infer something uh, from your uh, remote sensing that, that you actually want to know as an output of your model, then you can, you can compare your model outputs um, to the observations from the satellite and you can tweak things in your model uh, until you get uh, the two into good agreement. And here's an example of that where you see the black dots you see the inundated area for a river reach uh, here in Western Australia uh, and, uh, and uh, in the green line here you see what the model thinks is inundated. And of course you can, you can tweak parameters in your model and you can sort of um, uh, try tune it until you get closer agreement between the two. And so that's one way that you can use satellite data, uh, for instance on inundation in this case, to, to calibrate your, uh, your model in this case a flood model. And of course, the approach is very similar to that what we saw in another video for inverse radiated transfer modeling. You optimize uh, 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 tweaking parameters in the model to, to maximize the agreement, to optimize the agreement with the observations. The fourth step where you can use uh, satellite data is in model selection. So let's say I've got uh, a number of candidate models, um, and those candidate models might come uh, as, uh, as uh, different parameter sets, or they might come as totally different pieces of software, for instance. Well, I can then use satellite and other observations to select uh, which ones of those are, are more feasible or, or, or appear to perform better, and which ones uh, are not suitable. Example of that is, um, uh, uh, from my, my own uh, uh, past experience, the Australian Water Resources Assessment Model, or AURA, which is a model that the Bureau of Meteorology uses to assess landscape uh, water balance parameters like soil moisture and stream flow and groundwater and so forth. And in that uh, um, process, in that development, there was a whole uh, range of choices in, in, uh, in terms of model equations, model parameters, uh, uh, representations of reality in the model uh, that, that we could choose from. And so we used a benchmarking system, as we called it, uh, that, that compared um, uh, all the, um, uh, the the model possibilities, of, uh, model choices against a whole range of observations. Some of those were on-ground observations like stream flow, recharge, and so forth, but also remotely sensed leaf area index, for instance, to see if the vegetation was well represented in soil moisture, to see if the soil moisture dynamics were, were correct. So as you can see, satellite data can also play a role in, in, in determining which model or model version you would best off, uh, would be best off using. And there's just a, an example of, of a report which shows uh, you know, that some sort of um, uh, a curve uh, that uh, represents performance between different models. The fifth way that you can use satellite data is once you've selected a model and you've calibrated it, uh, then you can still further improve the, the, the model predictions by adjusting it using model data simulation. And that's a topic of a different video. So I won't go uh, any, any further detail with that because you can uh, you've already seen it or you can see it, uh, but essentially it, uh, uh, it, it, from time step to time step, it brings the model closer to the observations. And then the sixth way is once you've run your model, you've done what you want to do in terms of calibrating, selecting and maybe data simulation, you might still have some observations that you didn't use beforehand that you want to use to evaluate your model. To basically say, well, given all the, uh, all the effort we've put in, how good is our model? Uh, for instance, you might want to get some sense of uncertainty uh, in the model uh, predictions or the model estimates. Uh, and here's an example of that um, using uh, GRACE water storage. So in one of the previous videos, uh, we spoke about uh, GRACE and how it measures 
changes in the, the total uh, water storage at the Earth's surface. And here's an example of that for these blue areas, so most of southeast and southwest Australia. And, and uh, in black here, you see the measurements of the satellite uh, over time uh, from uh, 2002 when the satellite was launched uh, to, to the end of 2010. And then in blue, you see what the model predicted happened over the same period. And then you can start making some comment about uh, how good or how bad the model is. For instance, you could say, generally, it seems to behave reasonably well. But here in 2010, it really seems to have missed uh, that, uh, that, that deepest point, that, that, the driest point, uh, you could say, in the, in the time series. So uh, um, the challenge is to, to, to determine how much of your observations are you going to use earlier in the process for calibration, uh, selection, data simulation, uh, as, as that will determine how much data you will have left at the end to give some sort of independent estimate or assessment of how uncertain your predictions are. Okay, well, so that was six ways uh, in which you can use satellite and other observations to, uh, to inform uh, modeling through model data fusion approaches.